be and like the impact that we want um, and what we do a little bit like what we said earlier. But I really feel that building a space that's LGBTQ um, inclusive starts with just building a space that's inclusive in general and building a space where like that communication can be open to everyone, where they can feel like everyone is empowered. So, so that was like, you know, from the corporate side of it, like, do you really believe in that? Like, is that really part of your mission? And I always say like, what's your why? So my why was really just to kind of be able to touch as many people as possible and pe make people feel empowered and feel like they have a place where they can grow. So that's what we really wanted to make. And fitness to us is just like our catalyst to making people feel better. But what we really want is just to build a house in a community where everyone can feel empowered right there. I'm good. There we go. All right, cool. Um, you know, who do you rise for? When I started to look at like through my fitness uh, trainings and who I tended to gravitate toward, I rise for the people who don't feel like they are enough. The people who don't feel like they have a home, people who don't feel like they are welcomed and celebrated. And I think that that is important that we create that type of space and fitness is one of those catalysts where it can build your self-confidence. So we need that type of space in all types of elements. Um, and then I looked at it and I said like, you know, are you willing to sacrifice that, sa sacrifice and feel uncomfortable? Because like we, like some of the speakers talked about earlier is like building inclusive spaces isn't always like the most comfortable thing. The easiest thing is just to stay in your box and kind of like ride with the people that you ride with. So you have to learn, it takes a lot of learning process in that also. Um, so this is our studio when you walk in. I think visuals really, really matter from a corporate side, right? So like when you walk in, uh, and this isn't just June, right? So we don't, we don't put this up on June to sell more coffee or to sell, like to get more, uh, n no shade on other people for doing that, but like, like if I don't believe in it 365, then I'm not gonna ride with it, right? So I'm not gonna put my flag up just on June, right? You walk in, you know what the deal is. If you don't like that, we're building an inclusive community space. With that said, we're inclusive in a lot of different ways, right? So, uh, you know, we have a women's rights one, the Black Lives Matter flag. Uh, we have inclusive restrooms. We have like a space where people can just sign on a wall. So there's a lot of different spaces, a lot of different uh, visuals that we, that we put up to show that we are inclusive and to show that at the end of the day, we have a lot more in common than we do differently. Um, Another side of the inclusive, inclusivity, um, it's not by accident that our studio is dark and kind of looks like a club, right? So a lot of times in the fitness space, it becomes a space where people feel intimidated because who's looking at me? Am I, maybe my body doesn't look like that person or whatever, right? We're gonna take that totally out the window, right? We're gonna put black lights in, make it feel fun, but you're so focused on the energy and the person beside you just being fun that we're not looking at our bodies or like what makes us different. Instead, we're in that 45 minutes, we're all one big community. So that's what we really kind of have you know, honed down on also outside of just like the different visuals up front. Uh, and then all in all, we're all DC residents, right? Or in some way we travel, commute, work, live, play in DC. So in many ways, I wanted to show that we are one community and, uh, you know, and we're all people. So, you know, these are just other little inspirational visuals that we have out there. Um, cool. So, and I wanted to say all that just to kind of show that like diversity and inclusion does not happen by accident, especially on the corporate side, right? So when you're looking around, you never, you don't accidentally look up and like, oh my God, this is the most diverse place ever. This is so weird, right? So like that was actually thought out. People would like take time and look at that, whether it's in their hiring processes or their membership or whatever. Um, so from a corporate side of it, you might work at a company that the CEO or owner is not the most inclusive, forward thinking person, right? So some things that you might, you know, ways that I feel like you could impact that and maybe make some differences in your communities or if you're, a uh, CEO, a business owner, and you're like, how can I make this thing happen or why, right? Um, I have always found that inclusion equals more customers, right? If you don't even care about people and you only care about money because that's just who you are, right? You're Scrooge or something. But like, if I have more people who like what we do, that's more customers, which equals a better bottom line. So at the end of the day, like, if that doesn't sell people, then I don't know what will, right? <laughs> Secondly, 
when I was creating my space, I wanted to make sure that we were about community, right? And one thing about our community is I think we're some of the most loyal customers out there. Or if we find out like in the barbershop situation, if we find out that someone's not on our team, we don't care how great the shape up is, how good the pizza is, how good the coffee is or whatever, we're not going there. So I thought, you know, if I really show who I am from the inside out, like we would get more loyal uh, customers, more loyal employees, people who are about the mission. Uh, one thing being a smaller business, I don't have a big budget, right? Every person who walks in matters. I can't pay my employees necessarily the same thing that a soul cycle can or like a big hundred million dollar company can. But I can get my employees on board who are about what we do. And they will ride for you when it goes up, when it goes down, because it's gonna go down, you know, like things gonna happen, we're gonna grow, fall, things happen. But they ride with what we ride for. So that's that was really big for me. Um, we asked in our interview process, we asked a lot of questions that people think are like, whoa, I've never been asked this type of stuff before. But you know, it's about, you, you have to be about the mission to, to be there. Just being a good trainer is not enough, right? Or being a coach is not enough. Um, also being a fitness studio, like we do have a lot of uh, millennials out there and more, uh, you know, more consumers. It's, it's like a, it's a woke day, right? People want to know who they're spending their money with. Like back in the day, like the, a lot of times the CEOs and, or people who work there just kind of sat in the background. We want to know, like, am I spending my money with a, with a company that supports the things that I support? So I think it's really important that you, you know, you show what you support and you bring in that type of customer base. Um, and last but not least, even if you don't believe in all that stuff, proactive is better than reactive, right? We've seen numerous times in, in the news where like a company is not inclusive and then they get sued or something like that and they have to go ahead and like pay a bunch of legal fees and whatnot. And outside of that, they lose customers, right? So it's better to be inclusive on the front end or like have diversity trainings on the front end with your staff so that things work better uh, and you prevent a lot of situations. So, so outside of that, membership and staffing matter, right? At the end of the day, I don't know, it's just a human thing, right? We draw to people who look like us. It's like, it's like an innate thing before someone opens their mouth. It's like, I see it in classes all the time, right? I can have a class of 20 people. It's like all the women go in one space, all the men go in one space, and all the minorities go in another space. I mix them all up. But it just happens, like if you just look around, it's just kind of what we do. So if you're gonna really be inclusive, you really gotta make sure that your staffing shows a lot of different types of people, right? So we definitely gotta look around and make sure that we hit a lot of different demographics. This isn't all my trainers, but just kind of showing you like we gotta hit a little bit of everything there. So look at that in your hiring process and look who, who is working there because your staffing will match what your membership draws. Also, the more diverse in your staff, the more you know, great ideas you get. It's so many things that I think, I'm like, hey, we should do this. And I run past my staff and they're like, gee, that's crazy. And I'm like, oh, you're right. <laughs> you know, things that were like, oh, I never even thought about that because you had different perspectives because we all come from different backgrounds, different spaces. So it's really important there. Um, this is a little bit about our membership. This is like a party that we did after we did the all butts, no guts challenge. Uh, so that was really fun. Um, but yeah, you just kind of get a very diverse space. So I'm always really proud and uh, gracious about what community we've be able, been able to create. And I think when we look around at a lot of the fitness community, especially in the fitness studio spaces, it's become very narrow, like in your marketing. And, and some things maybe you don't notice, but like if you take a step back and look, it's like even if you look at stock photos for gym or fitness, it's the same like five people over and over and over. Like, really? So like, I can't see myself anywhere? Like, am I supposed to do this thing? Or is it just for like this person, right? So we gotta like, you know, shake, the, shake it up a little bit. Um, in the fitness space, we've kind of gone from a space of like big box gym into studio spaces, right? So fitness, big box gym, we think of like, you know, uh, I guess like a Washington Sports Club or like a big space or like, um, I don't know, Planet Fitness, something like that, where because you need so many numbers, you had to kind of market to a lot of people, right? You can't survive just with a very narrow space. 
But fitness has moved to a very a smaller venue, right? Where it's more studios, it's more boutique, and and it's a play on community, right? It's a higher level of community. But the the scary thing about community, community can be a code word for segregation, right? People like when I say community, I might think one thing, but when you say community, you might think one thing else. And if you look around and your community is all the same, like copy paste people, then that can be an issue. And sometimes it happens out of ignorance, but uh, you got to look at that and how you build the more inclusion in your spaces. So I think you have to always like make conscious efforts to make pathways for inclusive communities. Um, you know, consider what barriers are out there, like outside of, you know, just one little thing like economic barriers, age, sexuality, uh, fitness levels, education. These are things that we consistently sit down and look and like, are we looking at this? And we'll do it, and then three months later, like, hey, have we done something great about this? Or are we still doing well about this, right? So you have to look at those different things, um, you know, in each space. Like, how do, you, how do you address that? Especially age. I mean, think about that within the fitness community, right? It's like, if you're not 21 with a two-inch waist, like, you're nobody? Like, get out of here, right? It's like, <laughs> let's, let's work out for, for, all, for all spaces. Um, so tips on the corporate side of, like, how do you make your environment more inclusive? So I'll say, if you don't know, ask for help and stay humble. I had a really good situation where one of our, our trans clients came to me and said, I love that you're very inclusive and you have a good communication space where everyone just feels fun. And I see you say you want to do all these things, but you could do this better, this better, this better, this better, this better, this better, this better. And I was like, wow, that's great. I love feedback, personally. So I was like, that's great. One, it was great because now I know what I could do to, to improve. And, um, and I asked them for a meeting, and we sat down and chatted, and we just, we just did a walkthrough, right? And I was like, what, what could we do better? Like, things I don't know. So that was a great situation for me. But two, at the, at the bottom line, I was really excited that we created a space where you can even communicate that. Because a lot of times you go to spaces where people don't like something and they just leave. So if we create a space where the communication, that's the next one, create a judgment-free, high communication environment, right? We have different ways, different pathways where clients can communicate, where staffing can communicate, and it's not a lot of judgment or pressure on it, right? We have like a little fun box up front where you can just kind of write a note and drop it in. You can drop an email into uh, like our admin place. Another thing that happens a lot of times is as you build a chain up your, your corporate ladder, a lot of times your frontline people will know things before you know it, right? So like people really build great bonds with our front desk and some of our other instructors. So they'll say stuff to our instructors that they wouldn't say to me directly, but it'll get up to me. So I've created a space where my trainers and my front desk can always speak to us, right? We use group me's, we have a lot of different you know, ways we can text each other. But that communication flow up and down, I'm t consistently telling them about managing up. Manage up, manage up, manage up. Like, let me know how, th how I can do things better or what we're not doing as, better, as good. Um, and then uh, we talked about this, uh, Rebecca talked about this a little bit earlier. It's like, know that you're gonna mess up, right? All right, you're not gonna do everything perfectly, but as long as you are open to change and open to getting better, that's the most important space, right? Um, and don't be afraid necessarily of offending the majority. That was kind of for me is like going back to where I was, where I was like, all right, if I stay in this little lane, I'll be really successful. But when I learned that, you know, if I'm open to everyone and I really focus on just including everyone, people either don't care or the people who care, we don't really want them anyway, right? We're trying to create a great community of inclusion. So you want to make a space where we are respectful for everyone. And if those people aren't respectful, like you say, they got to get another job, they got to get another gym. Right, that's not, it can't come here. Like, you just can't come here. Um, and last but not least, you know, lead by example, right? So it's important that we show in everything that we're inclusive. And I think I look, I, I love all the stories you're talking about, but I look at my role also as like, I'm a 6'3", 230 black man, right? So I can, I can support people who might not feel as strong in certain places and people aren't gonna say the certain, certain same thing to me that they'll say to somebody else. Just off some phys sheer physical space or look, right? So with that said, I can provide a space and be a great ally for people 
who might not feel as strong in certain situations, right? So we've, 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 we've created a space where people can feel vulnerable and they know that I have their back and they're not gonna say anything to them because they're my brother or sister, you know, so they're not gonna say anything to me. So it's, it's just kind of good having that community and having that example space. That's all I got though. All right, thank you. So we'd like to thank everyone for their patience this morning. We know we ran a little bit over time. So instead of a traditional Q&A, what we're gonna do is ask our panelists to just stay up here. And if you have specific questions for the panelists, you can come up now and talk to them. But again, thank you for being here this morning. that in order to be healthy, we need to be active. That's why I launched Fit DC to challenge residents from all eight wards to get active and lead a healthier life. Visit fitdc.com and join the Billion Steps Challenge for a healthier, happier community. We can do it because we are Washington, DC. If high heating season utility bills and a low household income sound familiar, help could be available to DC residents from Pepco, Washington Gas, Verizon, and DC Water discounts, potentially trimming hundreds off utility bills for income eligible residents. Call 311 today about qualifications and required documents. Visit doee.dc.gov UDP for online details. Apply for the Lifeline Service telephone discount at 800-253-0846. Bienvenidos a todos. My name is uh, Tomas Talamante and I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Muriel Bowser. We're very excited to have you join us this evening for our budget engagement forum at the beautiful Arthur Capper Community Center. Woo, let's hear a round of applause for that. This is our fifth year of doing budget engagement forums uh, and it's a very uh, critical first step as we prepare uh, the mayor's budget proposal and we prepare for FY20. We get input from residents across the district on your budget priorities and uh, what you want to see invested in uh, as we make tough decisions as, and compile and put together the budget proposal that we send to council. Uh, this evening, we're very excited. Uh, if you participate in the past, you're probably used to our fun budget game, um, but we're utilizing a new tool and some new technology uh, to get live responses from you uh, in the room but we also have people watching at home and online. So for those watching at home and online, hello, and you'll be able to participate in today's uh, activities with us using the Poll Everywhere tool. So um, your facilitator should have helped you log on, but if not, if you have a smartphone or device, you can log on now to the Poll Everywhere tool by going to pollev.com slash fair shot or scanning the QR code, which is at all the tables, um, to get to the website right now. For those of you that don't have a, device, a smart device on you, we do have uh, paper copies of the polling uh, questions, and so your facilitator should have distributed those, but if you need some, raise your hand, and we have some of our amazing mokers around who will help pass those out. Great. So tonight is going to be fun. We're going to hear a lot from uh, we're going to hear from the mayor as well as many administration officials on our budget process and budget priorities. But we're also going to hear from you. Uh, we're going to play some fun games and have a budget pop quiz where uh, you could win a very special prize if you do the best in the quiz. So we're going to actually start off with our first question of the night, where we want to know where you're from. So uh, on your device or laptop or smartphone, you can uh, let us know which ward you are from. As you click your ward, we will start to see green dots pop up representing which ward you are from. It looks like we're seeing people from all eight wards already, which is fantastic. That is really great. So again, using your smartphone, uh, tablet, or laptop, you can 
click your ward and let us know which ward you are visiting us here at Arthur Capper from. I love it. I think we have all eight wards represented this we do have all eight wards represented this evening and still more a few more entries coming in. I even see some off the map entries, maybe some Maryland friends. Thank you and welcome <laughs> to the great city of Washington DC and future fifty first state. Great. So as you can see, we have participants today uh, watching at home and here in the room from all eight wards. And so we're excited to hear from you about your budget priorities and budget issues, uh, as well as make sure that uh, the mayor gets input from you on, on just those priorities. We're going to go into our next question now. So how many of you, this question is to see how many of you have attended a budget engagement forum before, or if this is your first budget engagement forum. Great. So again, if you've attended one before, or if this is your first budget engagement forum, looks like an overwhelming majority of you, this is your first uh, budget engagement forum. So we want to say first and foremost, welcome. We're excited to hear your input. And for those watching online and at home, welcome if this is your first budget engagement forum as well. Overwhelmingly, 58% of you said this is your first budget engagement forum. So we're, that's very exciting. We're going to go into our next question. This is uh, a fun one. We want to know what word comes to mind when you think about DC's budget. So on the app right now, you can type in what word comes to mind when you think about DC's budget. And as you put in words, the more those words pop up from people entering them, the larger they'll become. So it's a live word cloud. And again, this is what word comes to mind when you're thinking about DC's budget. seeing some great words up there. Education, opportunity is a big one. Complex. I know our, our housing agencies love seeing housing up there. I see confusing. I hope after today it'll be less confusing for, for those residents. This is great. So as you can see, each of us have different words that we think of when we think about DC's budget. And that reflects the input that we get as we prepare the budget. So we have a complex budget. We have a budget that we want to make sure ensures opportunity and invest in opportunities for residents in all eight wards. Uh, we want to make sure that we're addressing issues like education, housing, um, but we're also representing our values. And so uh, today you'll hear from the mayor, you'll hear from uh, different administration officials, but as we prepare the budget, as we look to what are those uh, investments that we need to make, those enhancements that we need to make, these are words that we are, we are reflecting on, that we are thinking on, um, and that we are trying to address those issues. So we have one more question, and then we're going to hear from the mayor. Um, but in order of most important to uh, least important, we want you to rank uh, your budget priorities coming into this meeting. So is it jobs and economic opportunity? Are you here because you want to see more investments in health and human services? Education, government operations? Is public safety your number one budget priority? or is housing. So right now, from most important to least important, let us know, coming into this meeting, what is on your mind as your most important budget issue. Seeing a lot of great responses. Education right now is in the lead. We'll see if that holds. Well, it does look like education, for, for those in the room and watching online right now, education is your top priority, followed by housing, health and human services. I think Victoria will make the pitch later about improving government operations to a higher ranking. But these are all issues that are extremely important that we will be reflecting on today. And I want you to remember this slide, because we're going to come back to this question. If you all can just, thank you. 
We're going to come back to this slide uh, and, and do this uh, poll question one more time after you've heard from the mayor, our uh, deputy mayors, uh, to see if your budget priorities have changed uh, after some of our activities today. Uh, but without further ado, I want to bring up our great mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser. Well, good evening, everybody. I, I am really happy to see you all here uh, and to kick off our budget engagement forums out in the community. I'm very proud to say that this is the fifth uh, straight year that we have started the budget engagement process with these forums. Some of you may have already heard me say uh, that one of my priorities when becoming mayor was to s switch uh, the civic engagement engagement portion of the budget development process. Uh, I, as a council member, uh, was always concerned that the mayor didn't go out to present the budget until after the mayor submitted the budget to the council. Uh, and at that point, uh, there are some things that are movable in the budget, but a lot of big decisions have already been made. Uh, so we made a point of making sure we start that budget engagement process earlier so that we can get as much feedback from the community uh, as we um, build this budget. I am delighted that so many members of my team, our agency directors, the mayor's budget office, the city administrator, have already been working on the budget um, since November, um, building priorities, working with our chief financial officer, uh, and already hearing from many of you about what uh, those priorities are. Uh, we have another aspect of the engagement in addition to three, these three sessions uh, is I start off the engagement process with a telephone town hall uh, with senior residents uh, and we have completed that telephone town hall. Uh, we have also completed a telephone town hall with district government employees. Uh, and in that town hall, we collect information, um, ideas, challenges, savings, enhancement ideas as well. Uh, residents will have two additional opportunities to participate in one of our engagement forms. This Saturday morning, uh, we will be at the Deanwood Recreation Center in Ward 7. And on Monday evening, we will be at Roosevelt Senior High School in Ward 4. The forums are key for a couple of reasons. Uh, we talk about how the budget's built. We talk about all the major components of our budget. We talk a little bit about the revenue that comes in to allow us to fund our budget priorities. And then we ask you to do the very difficult work of helping us make some um, priority decisions. Uh, for the last four years, uh, we have had an exercise called the $100 game. Uh, and the $100 game was meant and is meant for you to think about our $14 plus billion dollar budget as you think about your own budgets at home. Uh, and while there are many bigger numbers that we're dealing with as a government, the idea is the same. You have a certain amount of money coming in, and you have a certain amount of things that you must and want to do uh, with, with that money. In some months, uh, you make trade-offs. Some years, you have more. Some years, you have less. Sometimes you decide to earn more. Or sometimes somebody else has, has decided that you will earn less. And in any case, uh, you have to take care of the things that you have to take care of, and you're thinking about all the additional things that you want to provide for yourself and for your family. Well, our budget starts with our values, the things that we need to do uh, as a city, um, and then we look always every year for fresh ideas around the government for the things that we want to fund. The truth is, uh, our government has come a very long way since the days of the control board, uh, where our finances were literally so bad that we were taken over by the Congress in many ways. And since then, we have been very disciplined uh, in the work that we have done. 
We have made critical investments in public education and public safety and in the human services that, allow, that have allowed our city uh, to be the envy of many cities around the world, that we're financially strong, that we're growing, and that our taxpayers give us the ability to make the types of investments in our people that will allow us to continue to grow and to grow more equitably. And that is the challenge that I have given uh, my team this year to allow us to continue to be financially strong and grow, but to do even more to make investments in the people of the District of Columbia, especially in the people in the neighborhoods who have not had access to as much investment and opportunity as everyone else. And we, I say to you ladies and gentlemen, have the ability to do that in a city as prosperous as ours. Do you agree? So uh, we also have an opportunity because we are at a start of a new term, a new four years for our administration. We're working, many of the council members have seven in fact, have started a fresh four year term as well. Uh, and we share a, a vision uh, that we, we will make our city grow more equitably. In my first term, we made really big investments in ending homelessness in our schools and our teachers. We invested in our workforce development programs and in programs that help our seniors age in place. We made it more affordable to raise a family in DC through investments in our home buyer programs and in childcare. And we made historic investments in our housing production trust fund. Uh, and this year, uh, we will help uh, to deliver. We will cross the 7,000 mark in terms of the units of affordable housing that we have produced or preserved in four years. And because, that's good news, I think. Uh, because of these commitments, we uh, have also been able to close DC General open three smaller, more service-oriented short-term housing facilities with three more on the way. We built uh, two new arenas in our city that help brandish our reputation as the sports capital, but also have built jobs and created opportunities for DC residents and businesses. And we had the resources that we needed to advance our DC values, protect our DC values, when a new president moved into our White House. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we have been able to step up and support Washingtonians, and most recently, I should say, during the longest federal government short, uh, shutdown in the history of our nation's capital. So now that we start on this new four years, uh, we are well positioned to build on the progress that our city has made, uh, but we also have the opportunity to think bigger and bolder. Uh, and that's part of my challenge to you this evening. Uh, uh, you know, you may have heard me already say uh, that we have to establish a new housing goal. We need to build 36,000 new units of housing throughout the district by the year 2025. You may have also heard me say that the tools we have in our tool butts right now won't get us there. So we need to all be thinking about what we need to do differently to get to more housing in our city that will make housing more affordable for people of all incomes. And tonight is an opportunity uh, for, for me to hear from you about exactly that. Uh, so I won't pretend that the decisions aren't tough, uh, but I uh, rely on this feedback that you give me to make some of the important trade-offs that come with any budgeting process. So we will finish our budget in early March. Uh, we will submit that budget to the Council of the District of Columbia. They will have a whole nother set of engagement uh, as well. Uh, and then at the end of the process, we will have a balanced budget. Uh, we will be able to talk about how we are using our resources strategically 
and responsibly in investing uh, in the city that we love. So I want to thank you for taking uh, this time out of your evenings. Tell your neighbors and friends that there are additional opportunities. And I also want to thank members of my team who are here tonight. You are going to uh, hear uh, from the deputy mayors. They're going to tell you what's going on in their clusters and why you should invest in the priorities um, that they represent. Uh, our agency directors will go around uh, to tables uh, to ask questions. Uh, and then I will also uh, hear your feedback at the end. I wanted uh, to acknowledge members of uh, my administration and cabinet officials who are here. Where are you? Give a wave and give them our appreciation. I wanted to uh, acknowledge a new member of our team uh, who is leading DCPS, Dr. Lewis Faraby. Dr. Faraby, please stand up so people can uh, hear, see you. And then I think we're going to hear next from Tomas. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you so much, Mayor. And let's have another round of applause for Mayor Bowser. We'll be uh, hearing from the mayor one more time uh, when we close out this evening. But uh, before we go on to our next portion, I do want to acknowledge uh, our Ward 6 council member, council member Charles Allen, who's joined us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us, council member. Um, now we're going to hear from Jenny Reed, who's our budget director, and our city administrator, Rashad Young. They're going to discuss the budget process and how we formulate the budget and then send over the budget proposal to council. So without further ado, uh, Jenny Reed. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny Reed, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Mayor's Director of Budget and Performance Management. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some of the key investments we've made in the most recent budget, a little bit about the budget process, and where some of our money goes. So first, let me start with some key investments that the Mayor made in her FY19 budget, which is the current fiscal year that we're in right now. When it comes to education, we made one of the largest investments in public education in the city's history, including a $93 million increase in funding for DC public schools and DC public charter schools. We increased funding for childcare, instituted a new tax credit uh, for families with young children, expanded out of school time and summer programming, invested more money into our school facilities uh, to make them more modern and better for our kids, and importantly, we added $575,000 to the budget in FY19 to make this very uh, community center, the Arthur Capper Center, open to the public under DP DPR's portfolio and increase programming for the community. Yes. Um, we also invested a significant amount of money in housing in our Safe at Home program to make sure that our seniors are able to age safely in their homes. Uh, $100 million continued investment in the trust fund, more money for preservation, more money to move forward our Homer DC plan to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. We invested in violence prevention strategies by continuing to invest in our new Office of Neighborhood and Safety Engagement um, and putting more money into violence prevention uh, funding and pathways programs to help some of our um, most vulnerable residents graduate with great jobs. And lastly, we are investing in our infrastructure. So we put $430 million into the budget to improve our sidewalks, our roads, and our alleys so that we're able to eliminate those assets that are in poor condition by 2021. So a little bit about our budget process. Um, our fiscal year runs from October 1st to September 30th. And I want to go through a little bit about the budget development cycle and how you all fit in into this process. So you can see from the slide, we're in the first part of preparation. As the mayor mentioned, we start our process for the FY20 budget in November um, of 2018. And we do that by engaging with our agencies and starting to get their proposals and their ideas for what increases they think we should see in the budget. 
We then uh, go to our community engagement, which is where we are right now. We hear from residents um, through forums, through town halls, um, through all sorts of ways about what your priorities are. And then we take all of that input and we work with the mayor and the city administrator and we put forward the mayor's budget. This year we will deliver the mayor's budget on March 20th to the DC Council. Um, and then it will turn over to the DC Council where they will hold a series of hearings and meetings to discuss the proposals. This is another opportunity where you can get involved, particularly if you see something that you like and really support. We'd appreciate you telling the DC Council about that. After the council has the budget, um, they pass on the, the final votes and it becomes enacted. And then we go to the execution and accountability side. And that's where my team comes back into play, where we try to make sure that agencies are spending uh, to their budget, making sure they're delivering the programs and services that we promised you, and making sure that we're tracking those outcomes and that data so that they're staying on track. So a little bit about our budget. I think you've heard the mayor mention a couple times, you know, our budget is pretty big. It's $14.6 billion. And it is true, um, it is very complex. One of those reasons is that we are a city, state, and county all in one. So we do all of those services um, all at the same time. Our budget is, our operating, operating budget is broken down into about three parts. So we have about $10.5 billion of local funds, and that includes some special purpose funds like fees and fines that you might pay, um, and enterprise funds like funds we use to fund uh, that pass through our budget for DC water. We have about $3.5 billion in federal grants, including Medicaid payments, and we have about um, just under, just over half a billion dollars in dedicated taxes. All of these sources make up our $14.6 billion operating budget. And this is what we use to fund the majority of programs and services that you all utilize, our employees, our day-to-day -day operations. But we also have a capital budget. The capital budget is $1.7 billion for the current fiscal year and about $8 billion over a six-year capital improvements plan period. This is what we use to do things like modernize our facilities, so building new schools, renovating rec centers, also fixing roads and alleys and sidewalks. So it's a really important part of our budget. And this is a little bit about where those dollars go. So these are our gross funds expenditures, meaning it's our federal dollars, it's our local dollars, it's all the money we have in that $14.6 billion pot. So you can see the biggest share of those dollars goes to health and human services. And part of the reason that share is so large is this is where our Medicaid funding comes into play. So we have excellent health care coverage in the District of Columbia thanks to the expansions of health care services that we've done. And a lot of health care dollars throw flow through this $5 billion. Our next largest area is education, where we have about $2.7 billion, both for public schools, public charter schools, but also our library system, our University of District of Columbia, um, and other agencies. We spend about $1.4 billion on public safety. This helps fund the Fire and Emergency Medical Services Department, our Metropolitan Police Department, our Office of Unified Communications, the people who answer the phone when you call 911 or 311. We spend about $1.8 billion in government operations and other services. This is where our public works are, so deep, the Department of Public Works that pick up your trash and clear the snow. It's also where your Department of Human Resources that helps hire people into DC government job sits. We then have about $442 million for jobs and economic opportunity. This is for our Department of Employment Services, our Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, our Department of Small and Local Business. And then we have about $400 million in housing. This includes our Housing Production Trust Fund, some of the housing supports that we provide for our Homer DC plan, as well as the, some support for the DC Housing Authority. It isn't all the money we spend on housing. There's lots of money out there through other supports, through the Housing Authority and other areas, but this is in our, our gross funds budget. So now I'm going to pause and turn it over to the city administrator who's going to go in a little more depth with you about some of the priorities that we're focused on in the current fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and good evening. I am Rashad Young, the city administrator for the District of Columbia. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about our priorities and expound uh, on some of the comments that Jenny made about uh, where we are making investments. The budget is the best reflection of uh, the priorities and, and, to, and to determine what matters most to us as a community uh, as we look at where we spend our, our resources. Uh, so there are a number of priorities that we are focused on in the current fiscal year, uh, certainly education being chief among them, and our goal here is to really accelerate the improvements of education, educational outcomes for our students in both public uh, schools and our charter schools. Uh, we want to increase investments in seniors and we have a number of programs where and initiatives where we um, are investing additional resources to support our seniors, expand our reach in health and human services, strengthen public safety, uh, provide safe and efficient transportation, uh, continue to ensure access to jobs and opportunity, uh, and we continue to make substantial investments in infrastructure in our community spaces. Uh, talking a little bit about where those investments are in each of these categories, and you've heard some of this in uh, Jenny's presentation, uh, but we spent about $2.7 billion in education uh, for some of the things that you see on the screen. $93 million more uh, dollars to support our DCPS and DCPS public charter schools. About a $1.7 billion for educational services uh, for both sectors that support 91,000 uh, students in DCPS and our charter schools. $87 million for programs and services at the University of the District of Columbia and our community college. $61 million for library services and support for our 26 libraries, about $41 million for parks and recreation programming, including our summer uh, and out-of-school programs, uh, $19 million specifically for our out-of-school programs, which rep represents a tremendous investment and increase over what we were able to do in fiscal year 18, and of course, Jenny mentioned the $575,000 uh, that allowed us to operate the Arthur Capper Community Center, which is obviously where we are uh, tonight. In the health and human services space, we spend, uh, again, $5 billion for all of those activities, the largest being uh, about $3 billion for Medicaid. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we've invested $1.6 million to fund a pilot intervention to reduce preterm births and improve health outcomes for infants. That is a clappable uh, item, I think. Uh, $7.4 million to increase school-based nursing and mental health services in our schools in the district. Uh, $5.3 million to assist seniors and low-income residents with heat and energy bills. And 29, an additional $29 million uh, to help support our plan to reduce homelessness and make it rare, brief, and non-recurring. So $29 million, nearly $30 million for the implementation of Homeward DC. Uh, and we invested $7 million in this fiscal year uh, to help residents with their water bills uh, for, uh, that's worth the clap as well, right? <laughs> Uh, to help residents with their water, fill, water bills due to the increased stormwater uh, charges that they are experiencing. In public safety, we spent about a billion four. Uh, a million and a half of that is for our non-law uh, enforcement and community-based grants for violence interruption to help make our neighborhoods safer. Uh, $500,000 for our security rebate program so residents and businesses can install security cameras in their homes or in their communities. Uh, $2.4 million to support the hiring of 42 additional firefighter paramedics and a million seven to expand our police cadet program from 70 to 100 positions, which, which allows us to be able to recruit DC residents to be police officers in the District of Columbia. Uh, in the housing space, uh, it was about $402 million, but this doesn't, as Jenny mentioned, represent all of our investment in housing, uh, but $100 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund to continue to produce affordable units all across the district. Uh, $3.7 million to make sure that our tenants' rights are upheld. $10 million for the Housing Preservation Fund so that we can have existing housing and maintain its affordability for our residents. And $24 million to help residents uh, afford a down payment so that they can buy a home in the District of Columbia. 
In the jobs and economic opportunity space, we spent $33 million to support our cultural arts programs, uh, $2 million for entrepreneurs so they can start new businesses in the district, $19 million for the Marion, the Mayor Marion S. Berry Summer Youth Employment Program, uh, which provides employment opportunities for young people, uh, including those over 21 during the summer break. $10 million for job training programs that support our residents with barriers to employment, and $6.4 million in apprenticeship programs that help lead people to uh, having good middle class jobs uh, in the district. In the government operations uh, space, we spend $7.4 million for snow removal. Some of that money we spent yesterday uh, to, to tackle the, the weather event and snow. Uh, $952,000 to support our efforts to become the 51st state in the United States through our statehood uh, public education campaign, and $10.9 million to demolish uh, DC General, which we were able to close this year. Uh, for our seniors, which remain a, a key priority for us, uh, Jenny mentioned the Safe at Home program uh, that really helps our residents and our seniors to be able to age in place in their own homes. Nearly $6 million to provide 257,000 rides for our seniors to make their various appoint appointments and doctor's appointments. Uh, 11.4 million for a new wellness center in Ward 8, and 26 million to fund 50 new permanent supportive housing units for senior women. Uh, and we also were able to cut in half how much our seniors' property taxes can go up each year uh, so that if they qualify for our reduced property tax rate, their property tax can't grow by more than 5% uh, a year. And that's another way that we are working to keep seniors in their own homes uh, who have invested and stayed in the District of Columbia. So we have, a, as has been mentioned at the beginning, a big, a complex, sometimes confusing budget uh, that is full of over $14 billion worth of resources to support the priorities that this community says are important and make sure that the programs and services that you want and that are uh, certainly that are in the vision of the mayor can be delivered uh, to the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tomas who will move us to the next phase of our discussion. All right, thank you so much to the uh, city administrator and Jenny Reed for uh, that great uh, presentation on our budget process and overview on how we've spent the funds uh, in the past. Uh, we're gonna do pop quiz time. So again, I, I flagged for you all at the beginning that we would do a pop quiz. Uh, after to see if you all were paying attention. So if you would pull out your uh, devices and tablets, uh, I'm excited to live my game show host uh, fantasy right now. We're gonna do DC budget. And again, there's gonna be a little reward at the end for uh, the participant that does the best in our DC budget 101 pop quiz. So we're gonna start out with our first question, if you will. Question number one. What is the District of Columbia's fiscal year? October 1st through September 30th, January 1st through December 31st, September 30th through October 1st, or June 1st through May 31st? What is the District of Columbia's fiscal year? You got about 10 more seconds for people to answer. I can see the people that took notes right away were. <laughs> the answer is October 1st through September 30th. So about 85% of you got that right. Congratulations. So here's the cool part of this technology. We have a leaderboard. So if we go to the leaderboard right now, CMS is leading right now. So these are our top leaders. So we will see if you stay in the top spot after the next question. So let's go to question number two. How much is DC's FY19 operating budget for programs and services? And again, that's our operated, operating budget. It's our day-to-day -day operations. It's at 10.9 billion, 11.9 billion, 12.9 billion, or 14.6 billion? Let's see if our leaders can stay in the lead with that one. Got about seven more seconds to put in your, your answer. 
All right, it is 14.6 billion. So 77% of you got that right. Who got that right? Let me hear it. Woo! So let's see, leaderboard is changing while well, Josh moved up. Congratulations to Josh. AV, Andrew Pratt, we got some good results up there. Now we're going to question number three. How much is the district's FY19 capital budget? Again, that's uh, long-term assets. So think of this building we're in right now. Think of school modernization. Is that 1.7 billion, 2.3 billion, 3.3 billion, or 4.3 billion? And where's Josh at? Josh, are you gonna stay on the leaderboard? <laughs> we got about 10 more seconds on that one. What is the FY19 capital budget? What was the FY19 capital budget? The answer is 1.7 billion. So 65% of you got that right just now. So congratulations. Now let's see the leaderboard. Oh, Andrew moved up to the top. Good job, Andrew. All right, one final question. Which of the following areas is allocated the largest percentage of the budget? Is it jobs and economic opportunity? Education, health and human services, government operations, public safety, or housing? Again, which gets the largest share of our budget? Got about seven more seconds to see. All righty. It's health and human services. So 68% of y'all got that right. <laughs> All right, here's our final leaderboard. Let's see who took home the prize. Woo, Jonita. Congratulations, raise your hand, stand up. Let's see you. Woo. Stand up so everyone can see you, who, who took it home. So if, you will, if you're on the leaderboard, uh, please see the registration desk uh, after today's forum. We're going to hook you up with some baseball or basketball tickets. So thank you so, so much. It's a fun thing. So now we're going to get to hear from our deputy mayors uh, before we go into our next section. Our great deputy mayors and, and two of our uh, amazing directors are going to talk a little bit more about their, uh, the investments in their cluster and give you a little bit of a preview of some themes as we look to FY20. Uh, I want you to, to pay attention to, to this portion because we're going to then go into a discussion about your budget priorities and the mayor and our deputy mayors are going to make rounds and listen uh, to you about your FY20 budget priorities, some of your FY20 fresh ideas. I know we got some great fresh ideas during our senior telephone town hall. Um, so we're going to start that section uh, now. So first we're going to hear for our deputy mayor of health and human services, uh, our interim Dep deputy mayor, direct, uh, director, uh, deputy mayor. Uh, Wayne Turnage. Wayne. Good evening. This has been a, a rather consequential year for the Health and Human Services, and I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes to explain why I believe that as you consider your budget priorities, you should lean heavily on the work that we do in health and human services. Uh, the themes that underlie the work that we do are, are addressing the very challenging and vexing problem of homelessness, uh, improving the quality of life for our seniors, and supporting families. Now, think about some of the achievements that uh, the mayor has been able to accomplish uh, because of the uh, priorities that have been uh, uh, tilted towards those themes. Uh, you've heard that we've closed uh, D.C. General, and what made that possible were the, were the investments uh, that she made in short-term housing in Ward 4, 7, and 8. Uh, we all know that short-term housing is, 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 a, is a much better place to be than uh, a housing in D.C. General. And so if you want to see those kinds of investments uh, to continue, we need you to uh, consider that as you walk through, uh, think through your budget priorities. Uh, we also have plans to create a, a, a new $40 million uh, men's shelter with uh, service enriched programming uh, at 801 East Main Street, at, at the East End Men's Shelter. Um, and it was, if you think about all of the investments that we've made since the mayor took office, uh, we can tell you that uh, homelessness alone, family homelessness, has decreased by 40 percent, and we've reduced overall homelessness by 17 percent. Uh, we will also hope to continue to make big investments in our seniors. 
uh, the, the, the emphasis that uh, uh, the mayor has placed on our seniors is allowing them to live with quality at home, away from some of the large institutions that can be sometimes uh, uh, depressing uh, for those who are away from family. Uh, in response to that, we've made $16 million in, in investments in safe at home. These are basically adaptations that will allow seniors who may be struggling with uh, uh, some of the activities of daily living uh, to, to adapt and stay at home. As a result, we, we now know that uh, 1,000 seniors have these adaptations and they are living comfortably uh, in their homes. If you want us to be able to continue that, we need your support. Uh, we are also investing heavily in strengthening families. And the way to think about those investments are children, uh, families, and a focus on some of the things that children and families need uh, to be successful. Uh, we have a, a, a very uh, unique uh, TANF program where we've, we've ensured that children are always protected in the grant process. Uh, we have uh, 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 invested dollars to prevent families from suddenly losing money uh, when the uh, time allotment that the federal government places on uh, TANF benefit hits. Um, and we've invested $7.4 million in uh, our schools to ensure that our, our kids have better access to school-based mental health services. And finally, we have to focus on health care. Uh, if a city is to s prosper, its residents must be healthy. And as a result, we have made, and the mayor has made significant investments in health care across the city. Uh, if you look at how the district covers its residents compared to other states in the country, we cover 98% of our residents uh, uh, with health insurance. That is the second highest rate in the country. If we are going to continue... If we are to continue those investments, we need your support in, in tilting your priorities to focus on health care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Turnage. Uh, and he, he gave you quite the pitch because he wants to make sure he keeps that the biggest piece of the, the budget pie. <laughs> uh, next, we'll hear from Deputy Mayor uh, Paul Kine, uh, Deputy Mayor for Education. Is this working? Yeah, we can hear you. Surprise, I'm over here. <laughs> <clears throat> it is an honor to serve as Mayor Bowser's Deputy Mayor for Education and to share with you some of the priorities that we have invested over the first term and give you a sense of some of the thematic areas that we're looking at for the next term. Uh, I don't consider this a pitch because I think uh, when we're talking about children, we know they are the biggest priority. Who here does not support children? <laughs> okay, that's why we're the top of the table. Over the past four years, the mayor has made an incredible investment in early childhood. And as you can see from the chart, we've invested in creating more than 1,000 additional seats for children. In addition, we have worked very hard to continue to try to honor and compensate our teachers and our educators to the degree that they deserve. And lastly, over the first term, we have continued to modernize our buildings to create world-class learning spaces for all of our children and all of our students in the schools. We have done a tremendous amount of work. We continue to see the additional learning that our students are doing, uh, and we continue to feel as though we have a lot more work to do. In the spirit of looking forward, we think about three big areas that we want to continue to invest in. The first is making sure that every single child is ready for school. Every five-year-old in the district needs to arrive into kindergarten with the academic skills and the school-appropriate behaviors that they need in order to be successful. And we will continue to focus on our little kids, the babies, the zero to three-year-olds, as well as our pre-K uh, pre classrooms. Secondly, for those students who are in school, our second area is making sure that they are ready to learn. And the way in which we want to continue to do that is to ensure that we provide the in-school and out-of-school supports for all children to ensure that they have what it requires to be successful in school. We will continue to focus on our community schools uh, as well as other trauma-informed interventions to see that happen.
We also want to continue to provide the adults in our buildings, our honored teachers and school leaders, with what they need to be successful. Lastly, then, in terms of our thematic areas, we are focused on making sure that every single young person coming out of our schools is ready for career. We anchor on the idea that every resident of the District of Columbia needs to be ready for a middle-income career by middle age to make sure that they have the skills that they need, that our secondary schools support them in doing that, and that our workforce and job training programs are fair and equitable, particularly for our underserved communities. So for education, as you think about investments, ready for school, ready to learn, and ready for career. Great. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We will now go to Deputy Mayor Kevin Donahue, the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice. Hello. <laughs> Was I the only one hearing myself talk? <laughs> I have one supporter here. OK. Um, I'm going to pretend everyone heard that. It was very eloquent. So just imagine the past 60 seconds as being better than what you're about to hear. Um, so I was talking about the first couple of years we had to stabilize basic investments. Uh, I used to get texts of every time we ran out of an ambulance. Uh, so the first item there you see was just stabilizing our emergency response to 911. We hired 56 new call takers between 911 and 311. We have $12 million annually that we spend on more ambulances, so we put out the same number every day for 15 years. Uh, we, uh, and this led to what was now a 97% availability rate that was a 70% availability rate. Uh, similar story with MPD. We had a, a declining number of officers, making it more difficult for officers to do anything but run from call to call. Uh, and so we invested in the cadet program. We invested in um, uh, uh, incentives for people who live in D.C. to join the MPD and once they come here to actually stay in D.C. once they were an officer. And then two weeks ago, recognizing the need to bring services to our returning citizens, we opened something called the Ready Center. And the Ready Center is a building that we built right behind the DC jail. And instead of asking returning citizens to go to all DC government agencies, we are bringing them to them at the DC jail so they can, they can get, thank you. <laughs> In the course of public safety, I rarely get that, so I'm very happy. <laughs> um, uh, we have DMV on site who prints, takes photos and prints and gives people ID before they leave. We have DBH who's not far away, but they're actually on site and can start counseling there. And we have job resource connections that are on site. And finally, out of the NEAR Act, we stood up the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. And this is really moving from stabilizing those core services to doing things that are new and innovative. Uh, Dell McFadden, the director, is here in the room. And what that office does is it identifies individuals who have been caught up in violence, recognizes that we have to meet them where they are in their life, recognizes their barriers and brings job services to them, therapy services to them, and allows for them to carve, carve out their own path and we support them as they achieve what their human potential is. So moving forward, there's two themes. So first of all, when you started out, you did the priority list. I think public safety was fifth. And there's advantages for public safety being fifth and not first. Um, and part of that is recognizing that if we were to really transform 
and reduce violence in the city, schools is a key, behavioral health is a key, access to jobs is a key. So I'm happy to see all those things that are much more part of the root causes of violence being numbers one, two, three, and four. But there are two things to keep in mind. One is that we have just started something like the ones office, which I consider to be in its infancy and has to grow. And the second item is the way to, for everyone here to get what they want is to grow the size of the pie. And if you have a city, in other words, the revenues, so if you have a city that is safe, you have a city that provides the foundations and conditions to be able to develop more of a tax base for everyone to be able to have the funding they want and not to make the kind of trade-offs that you're going to be able to have to ask, that you're going to be asked to make later tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We will now hear from Victoria Wasmer, who our Director of Agency Operations. I know I have my work cut out for me because government operations was in the last place. Now, I'm not necessarily going to think that I'm going to move up to first, but I would love to just increase that percentage. So I'm going to try and give a pitch. Who really appreciated having the snow removed yesterday so that folks could get back to work and to school today? We have learned a lot and we've done a tremendous amount in our snow preparedness. We have a snow team, they meet every year with a snow summit and it brings together uh, over 1,200 folks who try to ensure that we can do early alerts and then be on top of the storm as it's coming in. Um, it's Department of Public Works, it's our District Department of, Pu of Transportation, and our Homeland Security and Emergency Operations Group, who are really the three tiers of ensuring that we're prepared and we can clear and get folks back to work and to school. Um, primary, of course, is safety and the safety of the residents, and that's where sometimes the mayor has to make the tough call when we have to shut down uh, the government. But the goal is to ensure that we can get folks back to work because every day that we lose, and we saw this, of course, with the federal government shutdown, there's a reduction in what we have in our productivity and in our economy and in folks being able to um, have the wages that they need to be able to have to support their families. So I just want to say, um, the snow budget is a really necessary budget. We're trying to stay on top of it and making sure that we use those resources wisely. Um, the fleet was very old, and in fact, that's one of the areas in our capital investment that we've been putting in to, in order to be able to replace the fleet of um, the snow removal vehicles and the heavy equipment that's necessary to put that in place. Sometimes we have to hire third-party contractors, and in fact, we've put in smarter contract vehicles in order to be able to maximize the district dollar. The second thing I wanted to talk about was another uh, top priority for our Department of um, Motor Vehicles. In fact, they've just this past year put in place the opportunity for folks when they go forward to uh, register for your driver's license or for your state ID card, the ability to register to vote. And it's called auto enrollment. Just in less than a year of that program being in place, we've had 50,000 folks who've enrolled to register to vote when they've gotten their DCID card or driver's license. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, my son, Christoph, my youngest son, turned 18 last year. He was able to go to the polls with me and my mom and go ahead and uh, make his vote um, there at our polling place at Czech. Um, because he had been auto-enrolled after getting his driver's license. So I think everybody being able to do their civic duty, having an increase in our abilities of our residents to really make their voices known in the voting process is so critical and so important. And tying those things together, I think, is a, is a tremendous uh, benefit to the district. Thank you. And I see uh, Director Babbers, who's here, who heads our Department of uh, Motor Vehicles. And of course, this was under her tenure, putting this in place. Thank you. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about really briefly is just the ability to ensure that we have accessible spaces, both our parks, our recreation facilities, in fact, our election polling places, but also um, our uh, schools. And in fact, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act is going to be celebrating its 30th anniversary uh, next year. And in advance of that, we're going to ensure that all of our recreation facilities have been evaluated in terms of its accessibility and putting in place the ability to ensure that 
that as those get modernized, we allow for that to be fully accessible by all of our residents. This is a really important thing for schools, and in fact, every time we modernize a school building, we ensure that it is going to be uh, compliant with the American with Disabilities Act. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over, I think, uh, Back to yep. Tomas. And last, but certainly, thank you, Victoria. And uh, last and certainly not least, our acting director of the Office of Planning, Andrew Trueblood. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Hi, I'm Andrew Trueblood, the acting director of the Office of Planning. Uh, I am here on behalf of uh, Deputy Mayor Brian Kenner, who is actually out uh, on the West Coast tonight, um, thinking about how we can grow our taxes and figure out how to spend more money on, on our investments in the future by helping local DC businesses expand there um, and grow our jobs here. So I am here to talk a little bit about economic development, um, which is a number of things. Economic development is infrastructure. Over the last four years, we've had a laser focus on making sure that our sidewalks, our roads, and our alleys are in a state of good repair, spending over $200 million on that and looking to continue that into the future. We bro broke ground on our biggest infrastructure project, the Frederick Douglass, the Frederick Douglass Bridge, South Capitol Street Bridge, um, which is, is, it will be open by 2021. Um, and it also includes uh, en environment. We had uh, uh, green jobs through our Solar City DC program. Um, we um, started a green bank, and we also made incredible strides towards a swimmable Anacostia. And Tommy just told me, Tommy Wells, the director of the Department of Energy and Environment, that he looks forward to swimming in the Anacostia in a few short years. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, economic development is jobs, it's small businesses, it's retail, it's fresh food access, and it's culture. And up here you see a number of, of, of those investments we've made, invested over three, in over 300 small businesses through our Great Streets program. We have clean teams in every ward of the district. We had a neighborhood prosperity fund program um, in, uh, that, that uh, has funded a community grocery store in uh, Ward 8 in the Bellevue neighborhood. Um, and we've made uh, big investments in culture and hope to look, look forward to uh, a cultural plan and cultural investments coming out in the future. So the final piece of it, which is economic development, but it's also really its own, um, its own category, which is housing. Um, and you've seen that pulled out in a couple of the other slides. Housing is an incredibly important priority. It's been an important priority for the mayor over the last four years, almost a half a billion dollars invested in projects for, to preserve and produce um, uh, almost 5,000 units in the District of Columbia. But there's other programs too. Um, $13 million for Safe at Home that you've heard about for seniors to make sure that they can age in place in their homes. $60 million uh, for down payment assistance um, for, so that DC residents can become first time home buyers. So there are a number of important programs in the housing, um, within that housing bucket. Um, and there's certainly a lot that we have done. We've done more, we've invested more per capita in any other city through our Housing Production Trust Fund. But there's, as the mayor mentioned, there's more to do. And we look forward to thinking bigger and bolder uh, in the next four years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our uh, deputy mayors and our directors for those great pitches. Uh, we're gonna go now into our next part, which we're gonna hear from you. Uh, so to queue up our table discussions, we're gonna vote one more time on, now that you've heard from our great deputy mayors, the mayor, our city administrator, uh, and our budget director, we want to know, what, as looking to FY20, what is your most important budget priority? So if you would uh, vote on that right now, and then we're going to open it up to the tables to um, discuss amongst yourselves your budget And now, we bring you the following live press announcement from DC Mayor Muriel Bowser. Our regularly scheduled program will resume following the announcement. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Today, we are here to celebrate the groundbreaking of the Maryland Avenue Multimodal Streetscape Project right here in Ward 6. Let's hear from Maryland Avenue. 
Uh, we are also kicking off uh, our annual and much needed Pothole Palooza campaign. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by our director for the Department of Transportation, Jeff Marudian, as well as our council member for Ward 6, Charles Allen, uh, who you will, bo- you will be hearing from both of them shortly. Uh, the Maryland Avenue project has been a long time coming for Ward 6. Uh, we started design, since we started design, Designing this project, we have worked with residents to create a solution that will make it safer for motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians to travel through the corridor. And as you heard just last week, my 2020 budget, uh, I sent it to the council. Uh, and this budget makes big investments in building a safer and more sustainable transportation infrastructure. It includes a $122 million investment for a new K Street transit way, $4.7 million for Vision Zero initiatives, including bike lane um, parking enforcement and a $240 million investment for streetscape projects, incru- including the reconstruction of the so called Dave Thomas Circle. With this project, with this project here on Maryland Avenue, we will be start installing bike lanes, uh, which will make it easier for bikes and cars to share the road. We'll also reduce the distance that pedestrians have to safely walk across the roadway, uh, which is especially important at intersections where there is uh, high-speed pedestrian traffic, like at 10th and Maryland uh, near the school within a school, and 7th and Maryland near the library. These improvements and the investments in my budget reflect our commitment to Vision Zero and our commitment to making our streets safe for all. Uh, And speaking of safety, uh, Pothole Palooza is also about safety. This year's campaign is especially important uh, given that the region has experienced uh, record rainfall last year in 2018, which has created what looks like a record number of potholes. We know that this is frustrating and that's why our crews have been out working tirelessly since January filling as many potholes as possible. Uh, In fact, since January 1, the street and bridge team at DDOT have filled more than 22,000 potholes. But they uh, know, and I know, and you all do too, that we have much work to do this season. So we ask you to please continue to send in your service requests. I want to thank all the members of the press who are here who have been putting that information out all morning. Uh, 311 calls, text to 311, uh, as well as tweet to 311 and using the 311 app are ways that you can report potholes. So I'm going to ask Jeff to say a little bit more about the Pothole Palooza campaign and the Maryland Avenue project, and then we'll hear from our council member and take your questions. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Uh, Councilmember Allen, thank you for being here. Uh, Mayor Bowser's uh, recent budget uh, is one of the best examples of her commitment to Vision Zero, to making our infrastructure safer for everybody, and to rebuilding and modernizing our infrastructure. And this project, the Maryland Avenue Streetscape Project, is an example of all of those things. Thanks to the mayor's leadership and support from our council member, Councilmember Allen, uh, residents of the community will enjoy the benefit of a safer Maryland Avenue. We are really excited for the residents who live here along the the corridor, for the students who walk to school every day, for those who bike, and for those who drive along the corridor. We are going to be making it safer for everybody. We'll be adding new bike lanes, new traffic signals, new trees. We'll be narrowing the travel lanes from four to two. And we'll be improving the pedestrian experience by adding refuge islands, and shortening the distance that it takes to cross Maryland Avenue. Over the coming weeks, neighbors will begin to hear more information about the timing of the project, when we can expect to see construction start, and all of the related traffic impacts. I want to acknowledge our team at DDOT, who's been hard at work designing this project and getting us ready for this very day. And I again want to thank the mayor. With her support, this project is possible. Of course, this is a big day for us for a number of reasons, as the mayor said, and Pothole Palooza uh, is, is high on that list. 
Our team, as the mayor said, since January has filled over 22,000 potholes, and that work continues each and every day. I want to acknowledge all the men and women of our street and bridge maintenance team who are here with us, who are doing this incredibly hard work. Let's give them a round of applause. In particular, I want to thank Aaron Horton and Brian Lawrence, who are here, who are leading this effort for us. As the mayor mentioned, and as you all probably noticed, it has been a particularly bad year for potholes. Uh, this is due to the historic amount of rain we saw in 2018 and the freeze-thaw cycle that we experienced this winter. Unfortunately, climate change does not show any signs of slowing down, and so we have, at the mayor's direction, taking bold, have taken bold steps to improve the way that we respond to potholes, both responding to 311 requests, but also proactively servicing each of the wards to ensure that we are covering all of them. We will continue to do this work as long as it takes to fill all of the potholes that uh, we are seeing on the streets. With Pothole Palooza, we encourage residents and visitors to use 311 to let us know uh, if they experience a pothole, and we will respond to it as quickly as possible while we're also proactively servicing all eight wards. Each day, we are concentrating on getting this work done, and we appreciate the support and the partnership of the community. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Ward 6 Council Member, Charles Allen. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, this is a really exciting day. I'll, I'll say just briefly on, on Pothole Palooza. Uh, whether you are driving a car or whether you're on a bike or I guess even a scooter, um, these potholes are big, and um, I know I've hit a couple of rim rattlers myself, so I'm excited to see that. We had somebody call in my office yesterday, um, Ms. Mayor, and they left a message and said, I don't care where you start. Let's just go get them. Right, so, um, so I appreciate the team is out there. And please, as, as the director has said, report them so we can get out there and, and fill these. I'll say most of my comments really for Maryland Avenue. And that is, um, I think my history with this, it was back about eight years or so. But I want to acknowledge ANC 6A and ANC 6C. And I saw Commissioner Tamajian here. We'll give them a round of applause. So many commissioners that actually aren't here today but have been a hand, a hand in this over the many years. Um, this is one of those projects where it stretches across two ANCs. They both worked incredibly hard to help shape the vision and keep momentum going. Um, it's really exciting. Maryland Avenue, as you can see it right now, was a road that was built to handle about 30 to 45 minutes in the morning, but we live with it 24 hours a day. It divides our neighborhood. Um, it is dangerous. We have schools. We have libraries. We have parks. We have a neighborhood that gets divided by a road that we have travelers and, and largely commuters that cut through way too fast that put people at risk, whether you're trying to cross the street, get to the library, go to the park, or you're on your way to school. So the redesign is going to leave us with a safer street. It's going to be a safer street for everybody. It's going to be a better ride for cyclists. I think it's going to be a better ride for drivers as well, but certainly as we walk around our neighborhood and our community. So I remember, again, maybe five or six years ago, just kind of getting bought into this vision of what we can create here. And it is exciting today that we're going to help take this step. Ms. Mayor, I know you've sat in on some of these meetings, too, with the Northeast Branch Library. So I appreciate that you and your team have helped drive this to today, um, to where it's going to be very exciting. And I know we'll come back out and, um, and see the progress along the way. We'll help celebrate once this is done. But we're going to be proud of this project and thankful for DDOT's work on this. And thank you again for the community that has pushed so hard to hold all of us accountable to get to this day. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank the council member and the advisory neighborhood commissioners for their hard work and advocacy. And I want to thank our team who's going to be out here working on this project in advance. Um, we know that they're going to take every precaution to stay safe um, and get the work done and delivered to our community just as soon as possible. I also just want to call your attention to a chart that DDOT has um, put before us that shows our investments in the coming years to get to a state of good repair on our residential streets, sidewalks, and alleys. Uh, so these are investments um, that if steady and executed at the level that our team has been executing, uh, we will be able to eliminate poorly rated roads uh, in our city in just a few years. Uh, so with that, I'll take um, press questions first. Sam. Mayor, are you hiring more people to deal with all these potholes? What's what's the situation there? Sure. So let me let me ask Jeff to talk to you about how our teams are deployed. 
We have all available resources uh, at our department and also some contracted support filling potholes. Uh, it's not just about uh, the people, but it's also about the process, Sam. And that's something that we've uh, worked under the mayor's direction uh, to refine this year so that we are able to hit more potholes in a given day uh, based on the way that we're deploying our crews. I saw Fort Meyer putting up their sign. Is that one of the contractors that you're using? Or? Uh, Fort Meyer is a contractor that's going to be doing the construction work uh, here on this Maryland Avenue project. Okay. Yes. How many, um, this might be also for Director Moody. Could you introduce yourself? Sorry, Max Smith with WTOP. Uh, how many potholes a day, or can you get to all these potholes by the end of the summer? I mean, what, what can people expect? Yeah, so I, I can't predict how many we're going to see in a given day as that changes uh, based on a number of factors. Uh, but what we do know is that, uh, especially around the, the time of, of the freeze-thaw cycle is when we, we began to see more and more uh, popping up, and, and we have been working hard to fill them each day, and we are monitoring very closely the rate at which we're filling them uh, to ensure that, that we will get to all of them uh, in as quick, quick of a time frame as we can. You all, the city pays people if they, in some cases, right, if they destroy their tires on these potholes. What, how is that going? How much have you paid out? How much do you expect to pay out? I can't speak to, to that specific question, but yes, there's a process by which an individual can, uh, can file a claim if they have experienced damage that they believe is, is, uh, is due to a pothole. Uh, yes. How many? Again, Sam, yeah. So, Sam, we have an Office of Risk Management that evaluates um, claims, and we get claims for all kinds of things from a trash truck damage to tree damage, including potholes. On um, Some, uh, they will find that the district is responsible for and others not. Uh, what we advise people to do is um, be in touch with their own insurance companies, and the insurance companies will work with us. Yes, Adam. Uh, good morning. Uh, Director Maruti, maybe this is for you or maybe it's for you too, Mayor Bowser. A lot's been made about federal roads. You know, the National Park Service is having a hard time kind of keeping up with their properties. Claire Barton Parkway is in the district. It's a federal road. Would you be able to help out, uh, the, you know, the federal, the National Park? Okay. Thank you, everybody. And if may I invite the, um, the ANC commissioners to